morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adio Tortarolo. I work at the uh, World Bank, and this is joint work with Juliana Londoño Vélez. And well, thank you for including my paper in the program. So as Nils uh, just showed, offshore evasion uh, remains an important challenge for tax policy. And it's not that we haven't done uh, nothing about it, right? There is a, a growing research uh, documenting these facts, like in South Africa. And in particular, the policy uh, arena has been quite active. Uh, for example, over 50 countries have implemented tax amnesties uh, in the, you know, very recently with the goal of enticing wealth, uh, wealthy evaders to, to come forward and disclose uh, hidden uh, income, foreign income and assets uh, in exchange for reduced penalties and no prosecution. And more recently, many countries or, or governments uh, worldwide have uh, implemented enforcement difference enforcement in initiatives like the CRS, FATCA, and many tax information exchange agreements. So understanding the circumstances under which these uh, policies uh, work or not uh, is, is kind of crucial for tax enforcement uh, and the conduct of tax policy. But it has been hard to draw lessons from the country's varying experiences for many reasons. First of all, you know, uh, baseline evasion rates are uh, quite different across countries. The, when you look at the law, you know, the design of tax amnesties are uh, very different across countries and the contextual features as well within countries. And there are also data limitations. So it's, it's hard to access these uh, confidential records, um, but we have made a lot of progress uh, in the last couple of years. Um, so what we do in this paper is we study the case of Argentina uh, with offshore tax enforcement initiatives. And we think Argentina is well suited to, to examine these issues for many reasons. First of all, uh, there is a lot at stake. So uh, about a third, this is a figure we borrowed from uh, Annette and uh, Neil's uh, paper and, and Gabriel's paper, where we show that by 2007, a third of the GDP uh, was owned uh, um, uh, in offshore. The equivalent of a third of GDP was owned in offshore wealth uh, by Argentinians. And the other good thing about Argentina is that since 1991, we have a wealth tax. And because of that, people report annually their um, foreign and domestic wealth in their tax returns. And perhaps the third point, uh, more importantly, is that we have a lot of experience with tax amnesties or voluntary disclosure uh, programs. So in, you know, in a period of seven years, there were three amnesties. Uh, one in 2009, another one in 2013, 2015, which were not very successful at all. And then six months after the one in 2015 ended, we had one that was very successful and um, where people disclosed actually the equivalent of 21% of GDP in hidden assets. So um, that's what we uh, do in the paper. So let me show you uh, this motivating figure with official data from the tax administration. Uh, here we are breaking this 21% of GDP in different type of assets. And what is important is that a quarter of a million of Argentines participate in this amnesty. So this, uh, this is a lot of people, and usually in the top 2% 2 2 of the distribution. So 80% was hidden abroad. It was mostly financial assets. So you can see that 10% of GDP was in foreign stocks uh, and, and investments. But also you can see very interesting, I will come this but I will come back to this at the at the end. You know, many people disclosed uh, real estate, even though this is not covered by CRS. Right? So this is this is a very interesting fact. And there was a special tax, so I won't have time to explain the details of the of the amnesty. I will come back to this at the end. But there was a special tax that they have to pay if they decided to participate in the amnesty. It was 10%, roughly 10% of what they disclosed. And because of that, the government collected 1.8% of GDP from this one-time tax. So again, a lot of this was like $10 billion. Um, and like an equivalent of a month of VAT revenue. So these uh, assets were hidden in these uh, countries. You can see the flags, like most of the assets were hidden in the, in the US, Switzerland, and the British Virgin Islands. Um, and then for real estate in Uruguay, the US, and, and Brazil. 
and foreign bank accounts, also the U.S., Switzerland, and, and Uruguay. So Uruguay is like our uh, tax haven in, in Latin America. So what we do in the paper is we, um, you know, this extensive scale of uh, disclosures, we, we take advantage of this and we use straightforward methods to kind of unpack the effect of changes in tax enforcement in these uh, last, de last two decades. So we use tax tabulations that are publicly available in the IRS webpage, uh, very detailed, and then Pareto interpolations to, to kind of show some, some evidence. So the last thing we do is in the paper, we discuss several factors that may have contributed to the 2016 amnesty success. And I will try to make sure when, uh, um, when he showed me the, the, that I have five minutes to you know, rush to that part because I think it's important for this audience to, to know about it. So we contribute to a growing body of research. Uh, why do we think Argentina is interesting? I already mentioned three, three facts, but you know, I think it provides one of the largest natural experiments with amnesties. I think that by comparing these three amnesties, two that, were, that failed and then one that was successful, we can learn what might work and what might not work. And, and I think it's also optimistic in the sense that we show that large disclosures of offshore wealth uh, and assets can take place even in a country, uh, a developing country that had a history of, you know, a lot of assets hidden offshore, failed amnesties, but now, you know, we had one that was actually very successful. So let me start by showing you some figures. I will go uh, very fast in this part so that I can reach the last bullet over there, what made the 2016 amnesty different. Um, so let me start by showing uh, what people did in this case, so these are two time series of um, the number of tax returns reporting assets located in Argentina and uh, located offshore. And you can see that, you know, in the first amnesty 2009 and 2013, 2015, it's actually very flat. And then we, did, we, we see this massive increase in uh, tax returns reporting uh, assets offshore. So this is uh, coincides with the amnesty and some other factors, but it's mostly uh, because of that. And you can see that after that is very stable uh, in the next four uh, years, and we will add an extra data point in, uh, very soon in October. Um, so this is a, you know, it's a 310% increase in the number of people disclosing uh, offshore uh, foreign assets. Because of this, when we look at the values, the, the, the amount of uh, assets in, in constant, uh, this is in constant pesos of 2015, so adjusted for, in, for inflation, we can see that today Argentinians report that roughly half of their wealth is uh, located offshore. And it's interesting, you know, this means that they were previously evading taxes, you know, back in time for a very long period of time. You know, the ratio is like 20%, 80% roughly. As uh, Niels also uh, sh uh, showed, and, and, and many papers have shown so far, these disclosures are typically highly concentrated at the top. So what we do in this figure is we, um, again, um, normalize everything to 2015, but what we do is we decompose the top 2% of uh, uh, assets by increasing beans of, uh, of uh, wealth. And when we look at that, we can see that this disclosure actually expanded the amount of wealth reported by the top 0.5%, uh, especially the top 0.1%. And because of this, uh, when we look at the, the this is scale um, normalized to 100 in 2015, but when we look at the values, this means that individuals today report two to three times as many assets as before the uh, program in 2016. Uh, fiscal externalities. So we show that the massive disclosures expanded the Argentinian wealth tax base. Uh, so you can see again, before the 2016 amnesty, this kind of oscillates around zero. But after that, we can see that the wealth tax base actually doubles. And because of that, the wealth tax revenue also doubled since 2016. So the government is called, I think Argentina is one of the countries with the highest wealth tax revenue in the world. Uh, I think it's close to 1% of the GDP annually. But more, you know, even more striking, and I think this has been also documented, for example, in Colombia, is that once you disclose an asset, in the following year, you have to disclose the returns of that asset, right? And so that means that you can also collect 
revenue from other sources like the personal income tax. And actually using this simple time series, we can see that the number of people reporting in the personal income tax return reporting capital income, the num this number of taxpayers increases substantially. It actually doubles uh, before and after the 2016 amnesty. And also the capital income tax base uh, compared to the, to, the, to the other bases, which is this figure over here. So the four sources of income, you can see that the one that is increasing substantially is uh, the one for capital income. Uh, we don't have capital income. We cannot disentangle the amount of uh, revenue coming from capital uh, income from this series, uh, but this means that they are uh, collecting more, more revenue from this source. So how am I doing in terms of time? How much time do I have? More than five. More than five. Okay. So this one is also interesting. Uh, do taxpayers repat? So I mentioned at the beginning that Argentinians is uh, disclose the equivalent of 21% of GDP in hidden assets, that doesn't mean that they brought it back to Argentina. It wasn't required to bring it back. So they only had to participate and say, okay, I have this bank account in the US and this bank account in Switzerland and, and so on. Uh, but there were some incentives to repatriate. So some countries, especially those that don't have a wealth tax, when they implement an amnesty is because they they are aiming for people to bring the capital back to the country and you know to have a more productive use. But that, uh, so what we show in the paper is that typically those incentives don't work very well because there are many different reasons why they, um, uh, they put their wealth uh, offshore. Um, so in the paper we have a discussion that um, there are some clauses in the amnesty. For example, if you bring the capital back to the country, you know, you, you waive the penalty that you have to pay this 10%. And even in that case, people decided to keep the, their wealth uh, offshore in other countries. So we argue that perhaps it's not taxation is not the primary motive why people hold, um, uh, hold assets uh, abroad to begin with. And, and you know, I think especially in developing countries, the reason might be of you know, different reasons. We cannot uh, pin down exactly uh, which one, but we believe it's uh, probably economic volatility, currency controls. Uh, inflation uh, and so on, or it could be that they want to obtain higher returns. So let me go to, to this uh, last section of the paper where we discuss the features of the different amnesties. I think what is important here is that in terms of the uh, carrots and sticks is that uh, when you participate in the amnesty, they forgave you all the tax liabilities that you owed, owed backwards no criminal, criminal prosecution, and you had, uh, this means, you know, in the past you would have to pay two to 10 percent, uh, two, two to 10 times the taxes that you had evaded. So there were some incentives there. And in then, in terms of the cost, I already mentioned this, but there was a 10 percent special tax that you had to pay one time, uh, but it was zero percent if you had assets below $50,000. Um, so let me go to the, to what we think uh, could be could explain this uh, miracle somehow. So the first one is that the amnesty rewarded compliant taxpayers to, um, to safe keep the tax morale, but it also slashed the wealth tax to entice participation. Um, so let me show you the, the wealth tax schedule over time, and in particular to focus on this uh, period over here. So this is when the amnesty took place. The government decrease so went from notches and from four brackets to one bracket and decreased the tax rate substantially and they were actually promising taxpayers to eliminate the wealth tax by 2019. So it was a an important incentive, you know, promising wealth taxpayers, okay, if you disclose your wealth, don't worry because you won't have to pay wealth tax anyway. Um, the second factor is that the threat of detection became more uh, more credible. Um, so there were many tax information exchange agreements that made the, the threat of detection uh, more credible at this period of time. So you can see that in 2016, in this month, Argentina signed um, many agreements with, with this country. This is actually a slide that I borrowed from the IRS, uh, an IRS presentation. This is information that the IRS was actually, you know, showing the wealth taxpayers. It is interesting that this factor cannot explain all the, the success of the amnesty, I put a note here, because CRS was not fully operational until 20, 2018, but also because people also disclosed domestic assets 
uh, um, uh, real estate, which is uh, and domestic assets, which which are not part of the CRS, right? The third component uh, is that I think you need a favorable political economy in general for this to be kind of successful. In this case, there was a pro-market and business-friendly government, and I think they were also kind of smart when they wrote the law by earmarking revenue to fund public pension systems. So when you read the law, the first chapter of the law is we are going to fix the pension system, and the second chapter is we are going to fund this with a tax amnesty. Right, so then it was easier to pass in Congress. I think they were smart in that sense. And, uh, and this is, for example, to show you how um, the political economy, you know, people, when Macri took office in 2016, there is a champ in uh, an index that people follow in Argentina for, uh, it's like a trust index, right? And there was a lot of trust in the, in the government. And lastly, uh, let me see, this is an ad. Uh, publicizing the pension system uh, that they were going to to um, do with that with the with the tax revenue from the amnesty, but and and the last point that I think it's important it's not extremely important but I think it matters is the the um, salience of the amnesty and the communication of the IRS with with taxpayers, um, so I think. This, this is a, a photo of the main entrance of the IRS in, in Buenos Aires, and you can see that there were huge banners here saying, disclose your assets, your hidden assets. You pay 10% if you disclose it before December 31st, and then it's going to increase to 15% if you do it after one, right? And you would see this, in, this is a very, a very important street in, in Buenos Aires. Then when you look at Google search trends, you can see that Compared to the previous two amnesties, there was much more interest in 2016. And as a benchmark, I'm showing that the peak in COVID, people, you know, learning how to do their, their pizza. So it, uh, it was uh, even more um, important than, than that. This is an advertisement from the IRS where they were describing the taxpayer's penalty trade-off zero. Okay, so you can see on the left, they, they are saying that there is a 5% penalty if you disclose it, but if you don't and you get caught, you will have to pay this amount. So you have to liquidate the asset and get more money to pay uh, for, for this. The process was very simple. I think uh, something that Annette likes is that there is a countdown here on the, on the IRS webpage where they show how many days you have uh, to participate in the, in the amnesty. So I'm out of time, so I, uh, let me conclude. Uh, what we show in the paper is that, you know, large disclosure closures of offshore assets can take place, even in a country like Argentina that had a lot of stake and a history of failed amnesties. I think a question that you might have in mind is, you know, whether this would be, would apply to other countries or even a future Argentina. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, we have unique features, but we do think that we can learn some uh, we know more than before, right? And we, I think we know a little bit more than what, what might work and what might not. And, and here are the factors that I just uh, mentioned and I show you funny pictures about. So thank you very much and happy to take questions uh, after this. Thank you.